All right, welcome to Navigating Probate Court, a judge's perspective with Glenn Reeser. Glenn and I have been um, talking um, about this for uh, a few couple of weeks now, and we got a lot of great content. Um, just a fantastic opportunity for many of you. Uh, many of you are lawyers actually on this webinar, so a lot of times we have clients, but this time we have a lot of, of lawyers. There is a Q&A button along the bar, maybe on the bottom or the top of your screen. If you have a question, please go ahead and put it in the Q&A and we will uh, try to um, uh, get those uh, answered live real time. Uh, Glenn, any opening remarks? Happy to be here, it's my pleasure. Uh, appreciate the invitation to, to talk to the public in general and specifically to the attorneys in the room. Uh, it's it's a These are topics that are germane to a lot of our practices. So I, I, I enjoy talking about it. Great. Well, let's, uh, disclaimer for those of you, obviously lawyers, we're not giving you legal advice. Any person who's not a lawyer, this should not be constituted as legal advice. Uh, so just, uh, this is information only. Uh, Glenn served for more than 20 years on the bench in Ventura County. I appeared before you, uh, Judge Reeser, many, many times. Um, and uh, you were always I remember your humor and your wit, uh, but also you were very thorough. And uh, many of the people on here today have had have appeared before you with matters. Um, and um, you were the supervising probate judge for over ten years, which is a really big deal. I mean, how often do you have a supervising probate judge for ten years or more? I, mean, I don't think you see that 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 much. I'm um, handling not only the probates and something to understand is conservatorships when a person becomes incapacitated in California and can, can no longer do for themselves. Um, uh, many times they end up in probate in conservatorship court, which is a guardianship for an adult. And um, Judge Reeser, you also teach people uh, or teach other judges in the state of California along with, with other, um, are, are, would they be retired judges that teach at the judges college or are they actually sitting judges as well? No, they're all sitting judges except me. They, they just, you know, they, they drag the old man back into it. <laughs> so tell me a little bit about that. What is judges college? What is judges school? So, so there is a judges college for new judges, which is just an orientation to, to being a judge. But just like lawyers have educational requirements, uh, there are specific rules for judges. So anytime a judge moves to a new assignment, uh, and if they move to, for example, the trust and probate assignment, they're, they're compelled to take uh, a week of classes that I teach. A whole week, a, a whole week. An entire week, right? <laughs> and um, so, so all the new judges, because in, in a lot of counties, in many counties, they rotate yeah. judges regularly, like Los Angeles County, for example. So, so this last year, I taught in LA County alone, there were two new LA judges and then two LA judges the year before. And I think in, in my class in January, there's two new LA judges. Uh, but, but you know, the judges are from Modoc all the way down to Imperial County. Uh, so, so we have the, 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 I'll call them the baby judges, mm -hmm. even though some of them are, you know, 70 years old. <laughs> and um, we have, uh, I teach an intermediate immediate course uh, a grant program and what they call abuse in later life. I teach that with a geriatric psychiatrist. Uh, and then I teach advanced courses in topics that only the uh, most geeky trust practitioners would be interested in along with some of my colleagues. Well, that's fantastic. So today's topics, we're gonna talk about essentially the lawyer's role in probate court and a little bit of like, what is probate court for and who's it for? What function does it serve on a high level? In society, a big topic which I think is, you know, could we could go on for literally hours is capacity, and this sort of sliding scale of and and as practitioners, you know, for those of you who are lawyers or or working in law firms, you know that that's one of the most common issues in dealing with an uh, an aged population is is assessing capacity and just figuring out how to deal with it, and then we're going to co cover three common conflicts. Um, <laughs> the, in your words, uh, Judge Reeser, the trustee who can't be trusted, and then the 1962 Red Schwinn, um, and then the wicked stepmother and evil stepfather. The Red Schwinn is the basically the kids who have hated each other since one kid got the Red Schwinn for Christmas and the other one didn't in 1962, and they still don't like each other. I think we've all seen that. Um, and then what about the drafting attorney as trustee or executor? Many times clients will ask us, is this something that you do in your firm? We're going to cover that. Um, there is a geographic difference between Northern and Southern California. 
notable cases. And then right now you work for JAMS, uh, which is an alternative dispute resolution um, firm. And we're going to talk a little bit about that. So let's just talk about the lawyer's role in the whole process. We're, we're advocates. We're also advisors. Um, tell me what, you know, what are some things that you saw that some habits or practices that you liked in, in attorneys versus you, you know, you were like, well, that's not really helpful. I don't know. Where, where do you want to start on this? That's, it's a broad question, Jim, but uh, so lawyers are hugely helpful. I mean, in, in trust cases, for example, in, in trust disputes, it's almost imperative that you have attorneys because the law is very sophisticated and that's, that can be knocked down, drag out uh, litigation, almost akin to a lawsuit. In fact, very akin to a lawsuit uh, where there's full discovery rights and, and um, requires a lot of uh, skill sets. The uh, probate practice in and of itself is, is, a, is a, a protocol based form driven practice that if a, a self-represent, self-represented party is really uh, reads up a lot and, and uh, perhaps so has some outside advice, they may be able to navigate by themselves unless it's a dispute over you know, airship or there's some creditor's claim that has to be litigated. Uh, uh, in conservatorships, uh, that's sort of a free for all because any interested party can uh, attend a conservatorship or be or be be heard in a conservatorship case, as opposed to trusts where only the beneficiaries or heirs and trustees are, are, uh, have standing. And uh, in probates, there's a uh, it's basically relative to the second degree have standing predominantly. But um, in, in conservatorships, it's friends can be uh, heard in court. And, and so those are a little bit more uh, freewheeling uh, and lawyers are very helpful in those cases. Uh, there are a number of court appointed lawyers in conservatorships, but that can be um, quite unwieldy if the judge isn't, uh, uh, doesn't have a lot of control. You know, um, we have a question here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna read this, Phil asks, uh, typically, does the estate administrator have to post a bond if real estate is owned jointly between the administrator and another 50% each with a nonprofit? Is it legal for the administrator to take out a mortgage or reverse mortgage on the property? A lot in that question. Um, administrators, they have to post a bond, don't they? Unless it's waived, which, what are your thoughts on posting a bond in a probate? Good so, idea, bad idea? So back in the day, courts would often waive bond. Uh, but the problem is, you know, people uh, are not always trustworthy, even if they are trustworthy. And so uh, unless a bond is, so in, in a probate, a bond is typically required because uh, a bond is, all a bond is, is insurance. Uh, it just says you would have car insurance when you become a, a personal representative for an estate, whether it's as a an executor or as a, um, an administrator, one involves a will, one doesn't, uh, a court will require the personal representative to post a bond for the estimated value of the estate, the total value of the estate, right? And, and it's, it's not that expensive. It's, it's, a, it's like what, it's a small percentage of the total estate, but it does provide insurance just in case the entire estate dissipates and is and is in the wind, so to speak. And uh, it only takes uh, being burned a few times before judges uh, want to uh, impose a bond in every case. Many wills waive a bond, which means uh, a court uh, should not impose a bond because the, t the testator, the person who wrote the will has, has commanded that there won't be a bond for their designated executor. Uh, but in California now, uh, in most counties, if the executor is out of the state, uh, we impose a bond anyway. Uh, and there's a, there's a statutory allowance for that. You know, I don't know if you remember the case, and I this must have been 18 years ago. Uh, I was appearing before you on a probate. This is all public record. What I'm going to say is on the record. Um, you, in your probate notes, which is something a, 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 the court will communicate to an attorney a couple of days before a hearing typically, the probate notes, you wanted to know, is there any, how much is left in the estate? Because we did our accounting and we said, there's this 40,000 or whatever's left. And you said, well, how much today is in the estate? And so 
when I went to court, uh, you, you asked me how much is in there and I said zero. And you said, what happened to the money? And I said, I can't tell you. And you said, well, yeah, you're going to tell me. I was like, no, I can't tell you. And uh, I, I recall you issuing a bench warrant for the administrator's arrest. And I think she was picked up, but she basically embezzled the money is what, what happened. And it wasn't that much money, but it, ha it does happen. So it, it, um, it happens more than you can imagine. Right. Yep. So, um, all right, let's, let's move on here. Let's talk about capacity. And we, you know, I've got some, I'm not going to belabor everyone and, and read all this, but I, I do think we need to cover, you know, we're not doctors, you know, lawyers aren't doctors, but we're kind of put in that position where we have to assess capacity. I'd like you to talk about probably code 60, 100 and 810 and 812. And then also the difference between, you know, some of these trusts that come out of lawyers' offices, sometimes they're 100 pages and sometimes they're 10 and sometimes it's a two page amendment. Sometimes it's a codicil to a will or a will or power of attorney. Just talk about the scope or the range of capacity. And for the non-attorneys here, the reason we're talking about this is I think this is one of the thorniest issues that lawyers deal with if they serve uh, an elder, typically an elderly uh, population, which estate planning attorneys right, necessarily do. Um, you look at this, this image uh, of this elderly lady looking out the window sort of wistfully. Um, how do we assess capacity? What, what's our role? What, what should we do? What should we not do? Just, I'll just make it a free for all. And if you guys have questions, go ahead and put questions in the Q&A. So when a testator signs a will or a settlor signs a trust, they are required to have capacity. Except the rules for wills and trusts are completely different. And the capacity that's required to execute either of those instruments is completely different. And the standards are, are wildly divergent. Uh, and the reasons are historical. It all goes back to 1870s and the Lord Chancellor in England and how his family, quote unquote, evolved. Um, uh, but lawyers in law school learned a rule about capacity to, to, to draft a will, whether it's a holograph on a napkin or whether it's a, a, a long document uh, that's prepared by an attorney or someone else. Uh, only three things are required. It's, it's probate code section 6100.5. And it just says, you have to know you're making a will. You have to know who your issue are, you know, who your relatives are that you would be able to pass your assets on to. And you have to know what your property is. You know, I own the house, you know, in Fresno. And that's it. That's all you have to know. It's like the lowest, lowest possible uh, standard of capacity. And, and that applies to any will or codicil, which is an amendment to a will. It's almost like, hey, smell their breath, breath and check their fingernails, right? A absolutely. Yeah. Right. And so for attorneys, you know, if someone, if you have a, if there's some possible concern about capacity, don't have them sign a trust, even though that might be a better vehicle, have them do a will. Because you're just talking about a very minimal standard of, 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 of cognizance, right? trusts are contracts and so for everything that's not a will and it doesn't matter if it's a deed it could be a contract it can be a power of attorney and it can be a trust and trust can be very simple and it can be very complicated but all of that relates to contractual capacity not will capacity and that's defined in in the probate code in 810 to 812 but what's important about those sections is it creates a sliding scale of capacity based upon the complexity of the document and upon deficits. And I'll explain that in, in as briefly as I can. 810 just says everyone's presumed to have capacity. So that's the presumption, right? 811 lists a long compendium of potential deficits. It's not just memory. Memory is just one of like 10 possible deficits. There's executive functioning. There's the, uh, the, the ability to uh, differentiate. There is depression. There's a whole list of, uh, of potential cognitive deficits that a, a group of geriatric physicians and psychologists created, which can affect decision-making, right? And, and so they're all listed there. And then 812 says, if there's a nexus between one of those deficits and decision-making, 
then that could be a capacity issue. And you have to look at, at the sophistication of the document, how much the, um, in this case, the settlor or the person who signs the trust uh, is impacted by that deficit and whether that affects their ability to A, understand and be able to articulate exactly what they're doing, right? In every single complexity. So, so if you're doing a trust agreement, which has clauses that you know, non-trust lawyers wouldn't understand if you asked them to replicate it, <laughs> the, the, the person who signs the trust actually has to be able to articulate that you know, either verbally or in writing or in some form or fashion, right? If, if they have- so, um, so basically no lay person should ever do a trust, but because, they, <laughs> right? But, but they have to have a deficit, right? In other exactly, words, if, exactly. If there's, so, if there's no cognitive deficit, uh, it's fine. But, but, but here's the thing, Jim, under yeah. 811, we're, we, you know, I went to law school, right? I, and I took all these classes at UCLA Law School and none of them was in, involved uh, cognitive, uh, gerontology, right? It, it doesn't involve physiology that leads to undue influence. We, we're not physicians, but yet when people come into a lawyer's office, all of a sudden we're, we're, we're cast with this decision-making authority. It, does this person have capacity? Well, certainly you can ask the three questions under a will, but trying to figure out, you know, if somebody has some cognitive issues that aren't discernible through a regular conversation, we're not equipped to do that. You know, I'm so glad to hear you articulate this because you're the person who is teaching the probate judges who will be sitting uh, in most counties. Do the probate judges run the trials or are they kicked out to civil judges? Most counties, the probate judges run the okay. trials. Very, very important because you're, this is coming from the horse's mouth. You're the one who's teaching these judges and they're looking to you for guidance. We have a question from Patricia. I, it's funny because I recognize so many names on here. We have a question from Patricia, who's a lawyer in Alameda, and she says, if an elder has been diagnosed with vascular dementia, vascular dementia is a specific, from my understanding, it's a specific thing where you have some type of issue with your blood vessels that may temporarily uh, lead to dementia that you might recover from. So that's my limited understanding. But if an elder has been diagnosed with vascular dementia and the attorney believes he or she has testamentary capacity, what's the best practice? Do you recommend a neuropsychological evaluation uh, or a petition for conservatorship and petition for substituted judgment to guard against future litigation? And this is within the specific context of talking about an amendment to a revocable trust. So we have a living trust, an amendment, a diagnosis of vascular dementia, do we go the substituted judgment route? Do we go to the neuropsychological route? What 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 are your thoughts on that? There's like five questions in there. <laughs> so so first of all, to, uh, to, to counsel who asked the question, please give my regards to Judge Sandra Bean, who's the Alameda County probate judge, one of my colleagues and students. Uh, she's really, really good and, and she gets this stuff. Uh, if someone has vascular dementia and they're diagnosed as such, it's not the best practice to then just prepare an instrument after you, you do a certificate of independent review with another lawyer, right? In other words, don't ask the lawyer down the hall to, to gauge their, um, their capacity, though I know a lot of people do that. The best practice is to have them cons to have the litigant consult with, uh, thank you, Patricia, to have the litigant consult uh, with a geriatric prof professional, whether it's a psychiatrist or a geriatric psychologist, and to run the battery of tests necessary to make the assessment, uh, because many, most of those professionals understand the 810 to 812 scheme. Many of them serve as, you know, expert witnesses, but, but whether they do that or simply they do the uh, capacity declarations in the context of a conservatorship, they, they know the drill and they understand the issues associated with capacity. Some lawyers, in fact, in a recent appellate case, it, 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 it was um, very helpful, actually videotape the conference with the client mm. so that the fact finder can see exactly how uh, the, the elder, whether, you know, whether they're a, a set lawyer or a, a um, a testator, right? Uh, to, to get a sense of, of, of their capacity. But 
you know, a lot of lawyers don't want to do that because they, yeah, right. because it's, it raises issues of, of, of professional responsibility. So I think the best practice in that situation, especially where you have knowledge that they've been um, uh, diagnosed with uh, vascular dementia is to have that medical review. And if it, so if it's a trust amendment, right, it's, it's still a contractual document. It might not be as complicated as the, um, as the trust itself. So on that sliding scale, it might not be uh, uh, on the same plane in terms of, uh, of, of standard as the, the trust agreement itself. But that also suggests that you don't wanna put a lot of additional changes in the amendment, you know, like changing the, the no contest clause language or changing, uh, you know, adding uh, things that, that an estate planner would put in to update things because this litig this this uh, set law might not be able to actually totally appreciate those differences, those changes. Anita uh, from Santa Paula, who's not a lawyer, she's a client, and I will just let you know, Anita. Christine had her baby yesterday, nine pounds five ounces, totally healthy, and I know she helped you with your estate plan. Anita asks, when you have to prove capacity. What is the best way beyond the test, the, the, the 812 test? Who makes the decisions? Uh, one, two, or three doctor declarations. So if it's a wobbler, let me just tee this up. If it's a, you know, I'm not sure if this person totally has it together, but they're not that bad. What, as a, what would a judge want to see? What sort of evidence? Let me just put this in the context of litigation. What evidence would a judge want to see? So, so, so if there's a serious question as to capacity, the instinct of most judges is to not honor the instrument. Mm. You know, and, and, and I get it. There, there, you, the only way to set aside an instrument is through clear and convincing evidence. But if, if something is suspect, if a document is suspect, most of my colleagues are, are you know, absent some very strong evidence that, uh, there is capacity, they're, they're a little resistant to it, especially because quite often later amendments uh, disinherit people, uh, give all assets to possibly a caregiver or the, the, the one child who's in the home with the parent. Quite often and perhaps most frequently, there are um, uh, related issues as to undue influence so, so uh, and, and if it's not a clean case, you, you, you really want to dot your I's and cross your T's and hope for the best with the, with the appreciation that uh, if there's a challenge, you know, it's, a, it's probably a case you want to resolve outside of court because you, you don't want your, um, your uh, child in this, whoever is driving the, the, the person to the lawyer's office who made the appointment, you don't want them hammered for elder abuse, which has possible criminal penalties, but certainly has some civil repercussions that could result in their disinheritance. So, so you, you have to walk very softly in this area. Bruce, a very experienced lawyer from Napa, uh, says, ever since Moore versus Anderson Ziegler in 2003, my thinking is that the drafting attorney is in the role as a witness as to capacity of a trustor this places a duty on the attorney to document and preserve evidence for court determination of capacity. Do you support this approach? Well, absolutely. And, and yeah. see, see what, what happens sometimes is that the, um, the drafting attorney comes in as litigation attorney later on, which is mm -hmm. horrible because invariably the drafting attorney is deposed. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I can tell you what the deposition transcript says, you know, tell me, it, who called you, who made the appointment, exactly what did you do, exactly what did the set law or uh, some cases the, the testators say, uh, what questions did you ask, you know, did you do X, Y, Z? And, and they're going to be asking you questions uh, in consultation with their own experts, that is the opposing side, to try to make the drafting attorney look terrible and to look like a, a poor practitioner. So, the answer, Bruce, is everything that you can conceivably do to, 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 to have your notes uh, clear, to have the conversation clear, uh, because you're not going to do the, the, the estate plan without some confidence that the person has capacity. But we have to appreciate that quite often someone can come into our office and be very coherent and 
and have all kinds of deficits that are uh, below the surface that only a, a medical practitioner after a battery of tests can determine. Right? Yeah, and the problem is I think it's 2020 hindsight, right? So when they die, they'll go, well, psh, of course, look, they had this advanced dementia six months after they came to see you and they suffered for five years with it, obviously, they weren't, you know, and so I think this is just a problem that uh, as practitioners, we've got to deal with. Anita asks, uh, does the judge determine after applying all the questions and codes uh, capacity? Yes, the answer is yes. This is uh, probate, a will contest uh, is um, not a jury trial. It's a bench trial, meaning the judge decides. And then are all trust contests bench trials or can you, I think you can get a jury trial on some of them. It's been a while since I've looked at that. So, so, so everything involving probate court goes back to the old English chancery court that came out of the crusades in the 1100s. And so it's all the judge, it's all in, it's in equity, not in equity, but it, 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 it's, not, it's not a law court, it's a chancery court, it's an equity court. And the judge is supposed to use her or his good conscience to decide the case, even though there are some legal, um, uh, direction and uh, directions and guides both in statutory and case law the what i teach and what we teach our students our judge students is do the right thing get up in the morning and use your use your good conscience there is one allowance for a jury trial and it relates to elder abuse because when the elder abuse statute was created it was it, it was it, it, because it's a statute and it was outside the probate code uh in the specific area of what we call statutory elder abuse, you can have the right to a jury trial uh, and potentially punitive damages for elder abuse. However, what I teach all my students is don't ever let that happen because what you wanna do if you find out that there's a, a civil case, an elder abuse case that's uh, a companion to a challenge within a trust, you grab it and then you, you, you defer the civil case and you decide all the equitable issues. So the case goes away before we ever have to impanel a jury because impaneling a jury is, a, is quite a, uh, it, it's an expensive and a, a very um, more problematic task than having a judge decide these cases. Yeah, it's a research, uh, for, the, for the court system, for the, the courts and the court staff, it's a very resource intensive process impaneling a jury. I mean, it's just- right. and, and you have 14 people, you know, 12 plus two alternates, who have to put aside, in these cases, two or three weeks of their life to, to decide a case. Uh, Vincent asks, how much weight, if any, will a statement of objectives signed by the trustor before signing a trustor will have regarding the trustor's understanding of such objectives, such as explanation of discretionary subtrust, explanation of distri distri distribution of assets? It, essentially like a summary of the trust before they sign it. Any thoughts on that? Well, that's really interesting, a statement of objectives. Uh, certainly, um, you know, I mean, you know, I, I guess under the theory couldn't hurt, right? Yeah. I, I don't think it's gonna be dispositive because people sign whatever the lawyers put in front of them uh, most frequently and aren't paying a lot of attention to it. I signed my trust, you know, and I, I had to sort of push the lawyer out of the room and go, okay, I need to read all this. But, but most people don't read it all and most people, and most, you know, the good lawyers will walk through every particular provision. But if you're dealing with a charitable remainder uni trust or, a, you know, Q-tip or something, I mean, you can't even explain that to a lawyer, much less a, a, a layperson. So, um, I think, you know, it, it, certainly, uh, a, a, if it was a um, articulation of objectives, it goes. I mean, to some degree, it answers the question. Uh, but appreciate that, you know, trusts are complicated documents and there's all kinds of tax issues associated with them. And so um, that would, 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 have, would have terse statement of objectives actually uh, articulate all of uh, what, what the boiler, what lawyers call boilerplate, but is actually, you know, meaningful substantive uh, rights and obligations within a trust agreement. I, I don't know. I mean, I'm not sure the judge would, would pay a lot of attention to that. Well, let's move on. Uh, thank you for that. Let's move on for <laughs> to the trustee who can't be trusted. And really, you know, this is when I think about this, I think of burden shifting. I think of um, maybe little facts 
F-A-C-T-S, here and there that tip a judge off to a trustee who can't be trusted. So maybe if you can talk about how do these cases typically evolve? How do, you, how do they, when they arrive in probate court, and for those of you who are not lawyers, when there is a trust dispute, you actually go to probate court. And it's very confusing because the consumer says, I have a trust. Why am I going to probate court if I have a trust? Well, if there's a fight over a trust, or if there's a trustee who's going off the rails, oftentimes you end up in probate court. Let's, let's talk about, um, if you can just talk about that. So in the old days, right? In the old days, people did wills and there were trusts, but they were typically testamentary trusts, meaning uh, today they, we have revocable living trusts, but in the old days, trusts were created by wills. You have a will and say, I give these assets in trust. And the trustees were normally lawyers and accountants, right? People who were used to doing this, they knew how to go into court. It, it, was, a, it was much more formulaic. Uh, but then in the 1970s came this, this uh, passion for revocable living trust where uh, the person who signed the trust agreement would, would be able to, A, to revoke it until they die and B, uh, be able to avoid probate by, by passing on their estate to their relatives and not always, but most frequently their family trusts where a family member becomes the successor trustee after one or both uh, spouses pass. And, and so uh, family members, you know, they're not trained in fiduciary duties. Uh, they're, not, they're not lawyers and accountants. And so they think, well, I'm just gonna run this the way dad ran it or mom ran it. And I'm, um, but that's the problem is a trustee has the highest standard of care and you have to run every family asset like a business and it doesn't usually or always work out that way and 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 so uh because of this uh situation there are fights uh over how assets are managed like at the family home unless you, you know if if the the trustee child is living in there that's a problem. That's trustee self-dealing unless they're paying full rental value, which, you know, almost never do they pay. So, so uh, many, many issues come up uh, in, in not running uh, all the family assets like a, a business person would uh, using the highest standard of care. So trust cases are, litigation cases are very, very common. Uh, and the cost of litig, you know, the, the, the reason people want to do trust is to avoid probate fees. Attorney fees, um, you know, are statutory in probate. They're not that much. It's, you know, X percent of the first 100,000, X percent of the second, and then X percent of the next 800,000, right? And it's, they're not huge fees, but when people litigate trust cases, you're talking, and I, I'm, you're going to, you know, the, my non-lawyers are going to jump out of their seats, hundreds of thousands of dollars on each side, because I mediate, you know, like three to five trust, family trusts a week. And these are the fees that are spent uh, litigating these cases out. So um, sometimes it's better to just do a will, but uh, when you do have a trust with, uh, with family members, uh, they're not always um, particularly focused on how best to uh, 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 apply the, the fiduciary standards that are required by law. So when, uh, what are some indicators um, you know, or some tells it's, you know, it's almost like playing poker, right? And, you know, somebody does this and they have a good hand or something. What, are there any tells when a trustee is a bad trustee? Because what, in our experience, we have people, clients will come in and they say, the trustee's gone off the rails or treating me poorly. So what do we do? We send a letter, we demand an accounting that has to come back within 60 days. They ask for more time. They don't do it on time. We then file a lawsuit. We have to serve it. You're into it like literally a year before you get, before you even appear in court, it's, it's, and this is really, I would say this is really frustrating for beneficiaries. Um, any thoughts on that? I mean, is there any way to kind of sidestep that whole process or, or what, what do you, what do you teach the judges or is it, you know, you got to go through the, the letter and then the crummy accounting that they give you. What are your thoughts on that? Well, so most trusts, not all, most trusts require the trust to be distributed after you know the last parent passes, mm -hmm. or if there's only one settlor after that person passes, and if stuff isn't happening right away, you kind of 
there may be a problem, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so we have these trusts where three, four, five years go by where the, the child who's managing the trust tells the others, well, I'm waiting for the real estate market to turn around. Or, you know, I, I, you know our, 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 our sister wants to buy this, but she can't afford it right now. And we're trying to work out a deal. And, you know, there's a bazillion reasons why it, it doesn't happen right away. Uh, if, if, if a meaningful period of time expires and nothing's happening, the beneficiaries, the other beneficiaries, not the trustee beneficiary, uh, has a lot of rights. And, and, and Jim's right, the first thing you can demand is an accounting. And a statutory accounting is a very um, difficult thing to properly accomplish. Uh, uh, you can have informal accounting before there's litigation, but if you want to go to court and go, I want an accounting, you're entitled to one. It's, the case is Christie versus Kimball. It was one of my cases where the, the my trustee was just doing things I wasn't happy with, and I said, um, Mrs. Christie, I want you to account. And she said, well, there's no accounting demand. And I said, well, there is, there's one now. <laughs> and, and so... Uh, and, and so in the appellate opinion, Christie versus Kimball, the Court of Appeal says there's nothing more elegant in a trust than an accounting because it tells you everything that's going on. You know, all the assets, their value, every item of income, every single disbursement, all of the payors, all the pays, uh, it, there's, there's very little that you can hide uh, unless they don't inventory all the assets. We have a few questions. Um, I'm just, some of these are just straight black letter law. Is it legal to create a trust for a person under a conservatorship who is incapacitated? Yes. The substituted judgment, is it 2580 or depending right, on? Right, right. So, so, so a, um, when someone is, has um, a conservatorship of the person, you know, or, or a conservatorship of their estate, and those are two completely different things with different standards or both. Uh, their estate plan is frozen unless and until a conservator of the estate comes in uh, and petitions for what they call a substituted judgment. And that is uh, considering all the factors going on in somebody's life is 2583 of the probate code, considering all these factors and, and any more, uh, judge, shouldn't we fix the estate plan for this person? And, and that's a substituted judgment. Now, if there is no conservatorship and someone's incapacitated and you wanna change their estate plan, you can still do that, uh, but it's under a different section of the probate code, uh, which, which requires uh, appointment of an attorney for the person who lacks capacity and, and a lot of other safeguards. Uh, even within conservatorship, there's a bazillion safeguards. We teach the judges, I teach the judges when I teach conservatorships that they have to look at those cases very differently. You know, trust litigation cases. You're, you know, you're a judge. It's, you call the shots. You do the right thing. But in conservatorships, it's the judge's job to protect, mm -hmm. literally, to step in, what they call imperens patria. It's Latin, to go in and, and make sure that the the conservatee, the person who's conserved, is protected both in their person and in their estate if both of those are involved. It's it's a completely different judicial mindset. So Anita asks, so do I understand that even if you have a trust, you may have to go to probate court if there's a dispute? Yeah. Or alternative dispute resolution, which we're going to talk about um, here in a couple of minutes. And then um, Trinitra asks, is it true wills must be probated in California? Uh, it That is yes, if it's a certain amount or a certain class of asset. And you know, it's, right. it's a very small threshold that you get over. Right. Uh, and then if, Anil if, asked, if there's a house, the answer is yes. Right? Yeah, right. Uh, you know, and that's actually comes up quite a bit. We we will get calls from people. They say, listen, you know, all our family has is the house. Mom died. There's a will that leaves the house to me. There's no cash to pay a probate attorney. Can that person, you know, let's say the house is worth, I don't know, two, three hundred thousand dollars. Can that person actually do a probate on their own with, with the self-help self -help process? Talk about that a little bit. So the threshold's moving up a little bit in, in very close to the numbers you're talking about. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm, if I could find a two or $300,000 house, you know. Well, true, care. but you, yeah. Central Valley. Um, okay, right, okay. Yeah. So, so, so yes, um, if they can go to the self-help center and the self-help center in the court has a probate helper, 
Mm -hmm. uh, they can walk them through the process and, and all you're, but all you're really saving is uh, the attorney fee, right? So, okay, so, so it'll be $4,000 for the first 100,000, 3,000 for the second, and then 2% after that. So if it's a $300,000 house, yes, there's a $9,000 uh, attorney fee, statutory fee, but, uh, but if, the, if they don't wanna pay that uh, or don't wanna be shepherded that way, then, um, then they can try to do it themselves. It's a, it's a foreign-based practice. You have to serve mm -hmm. certain all the relatives to the second degree and you have to attach the will and, and the probate court is gonna be pushing back if you don't do everything exactly right. You have to inventory the estate within 120 days with a referee. You can't avoid having to pay for that. It's, it's 1% of, uh, was it one? It's a very small amount. It's a one tenth of one percent max. One tenth of 1%, yeah. yeah. Uh, and the probate referee has to value all non cash assets. Uh, and then uh, once the statutory period expires for creditors, because probate exists, believe it or not, principally for creditors to uh, uh, file, timely file their claims and be dealt with, otherwise be lost forever uh, or, or, or be. Um, you know, inhibited forever from seeking recompense, uh, then, then you can close the estate. You know, usually the, close, the earliest time would be maybe six months after you open it. Uh, it's, they're supposed, probates, simple probates, ones that don't involve a state, uh, estate tax, which is most, uh, are supposed to be open and closed within a year. And, and, uh, and I think the average the last I heard was 16 months. That was the pre-COVID average. So, you know. That's pretty uh, good. Anil asks, when there is a grantor who has two children, does it make sense to make both children co-trustees, any of whom uh, can act as trustee? What issues should one look out for or avoid? I will say that some lawyers will never name co-trustees. Other lawyers don't have a problem with it. Any thoughts on co-trustees? Well, so, so here's here, the, one of the general rules of jurisprudence and probate is that when the parents die, the glue that holds the family together is gone, okay? So while you think your kids are, are fabulous and they'll always get along, not so much. Uh, but then again, I'm, I'm, you know, I've only been doing this 40 some odd years, but, but and I'm jaded because I don't, you know, I only get the contested cases. Um, if you have two people and they disagree, that means the vote is one to one. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So, so that's a problem, right? There's no de decision maker if there's some disagreement. If somebody says, "I want to," you know, "I want you to accept the offer on the sale of the family home for four hundred thousand dollars," and the other, uh, in in a probate, the other co-executor says, or in a trust, "Yeah, I don't want to do that. I want either I want to buy it myself once I get enough money, uh, or I think it's worth more." And I think it's, you know, any any one of a bazillion possible disputes. And there's nobody to solve that problem. If they, you know, what are they going to go to court and ask the court if four hundred thousand dollars is a good price? It happens. That is a great lead-in to the 1960 Red Schwinn Panther II, and I, I believe you told me yours was the Typhoon. Was the Schwinn Typhoon? I, I did have a Schwinn Typhoon, and it was red. <laughs> Here's um, what's going on: two two kids. One kid got the red bike for Christmas in 1960, or you know, birthday or whatever, and the other one didn't. And the one who didn't still to this day hates the you know the golden child right talk about that as a genesis of disputes is is that really what's going on and because you mentioned the glue Tell, just talk about that of course it's what's going on right Be, because you know everyone wants to the smothers brothers mom always liked you best right so 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 um yes i mean you know it's sibling rivalry uh they don't they, they love each other, but part of them is just wants to, you know, uh, and, and, and so, and so when the parents pass and one of the kids is given control, either as a successor trustee or as an executor, right. Or even as an administrator who petitions for that appointment, somebody's got control over the others. And the, the way that control gets exercised is always very, very interesting. Uh, what happens in a lot of cases, though, is is a parent will get older. Uh, someone's going to need to give elder care, right? Either be, yeah. you know, uh, take be there for their parent. You know, my mom lives. You know, my mom's ninety next month, and she lives 
two miles away. And, and I'm there, you know, when she calls in the middle of the night. Uh, but quite often, pe you know, people, because a lot of our litigants are 60 -ish years old mm -hmm. because their parents are elderly and they, they either quit their jobs or they give full time to their parent and, and they feel a little bit of a sense of entitlement because my gosh, whether it's two siblings, one sibling or, or eight siblings, everybody's out enjoying their life while they're, you know, bearing, carrying the cross of, of, of parental care uh, almost 24 seven in some cases. And they feel like there's, just, you know, there's some entitlement there. Is that, d does that carry any weight with a, a bench officer, with a judge when they're, when they're looking at a dispute? Do they look at what the, per you know, this one child cared for this other parent and was there and the other ones just weren't even present. Does, does that play into it or not? It, it, it does under the theory that no good deed goes unpunished <laughs> because no, it doesn't play into it. But the thing is, uh, it, it plays into the, into the dynamic between the siblings. Uh, and it's, it's, it's quite often a problem uh, in, in, in resolving states right because there's a there is this uh animus between between siblings yeah and i think this is one reason um and i know i've in in my career i've done a lot of mediation and a lot of the people who are on here have done or participated in mediations uh or or represented clients and it's i i believe that mediation is a much better way to resolve a, this type of a dispute with the sibling versus sibling um but I mean, that's just my two cents on that. So let's talk about the evil stepmother or the evil stepfather. And, and, How and, common is this? So, so, so just going back, so, yeah. so, so it, the, the child who does take care of the parent, yeah. right? It only, it, it only gives more reason for an undue influence argument by, look, you were there, you were hovering over dad, you're hovering over mom. And the reason it didn't, you know, the reason this amendment was made, uh, you know, six months before dad died was because, you know, you, 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 he was dependent on you. And right. so not only should you give us your share or, you know, not only should it be equal and should we get rid of this amendment, but we, we want to torment you with uh, treble damages or double damages, however you want to look at 859. And uh, so, so, the, all right. So, so the wicked step parent, right? Yeah. This is very common um, because in California, you know, and just in generally across the country, right? We have blended families, people with kids on one side and people with kids on the other side. Gerald, in one of the cases you wanted me to talk mm -hmm. about, right? There's nine kids, four from one, three from another, and then two together, right? Uh, and, and and what happens, uh, you know, I handled this case up in um, uh, Dr. Grossman, burn centers, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, his he over the course of his elderly life before he passed, his wife, who was George Soros's Wall Street advisor, so she brought a hundred million of her own into the marriage. His estate uh, increasingly went to her children, right? Not his kids, to the point that his kids got nothing. He dies, and then his kids want to litigate against Elizabeth, who's got over a hundred million dollars to, to litigate against, well now 150 million to litigate against the two kids. So, so yeah, it happens very often. And um, it's, it, it's an issue. I mean, you know, it's a, uh, many of our litigation cases involve blended families where uh, in an AB trust, for example, it's very frequent uh, to have the surviving spouse appoint the survivor's trust to their kids. They can do that, that's legal. Yep. Uh, but it's when they take the irrevocable portion of the trust that was gonna go to the other kids and start um, you know, to, to dad's kids or mom's kids, depending on who dies first, uh, that it becomes a problem. Well, then as lawyers, we get those people coming in, they say, I absolutely, you know, my stepkids are the worst. I, I want to disinherit them. I want to, I want to, you know, this B trust is terrible. And then we, you know, that's that's just the way it is. So right. Um, blood, all right. Is, blood is thicker than water unless you're litigating against your sibling. We've and, got a couple and of questions. Water is thicker than blood. <laughs> we got a couple of questions coming up that I want to get to because they're relevant to our last um, couple of slides. But uh, just talk about the attorney as trustee. We when we were preparing for this, you said you do see it in Northern California. I do more often than Southern California. I do. And um, just talk about that a little bit. Is it a good idea? Is it a bad idea? If the client 
if it if it's an appropriate fit, what are the best practices to have the attorney serve as trustee? See, I, I think this is a residue of back in the day when lawyers used to do everything and a lawyer represented a family or, or a family business and the lawyer took care of everything. And, and I do see cases in which uh, someone goes to the lawyer and um, the lawyer says, I will be your trustee. I see some cases where the, where the client goes, I want you to be my trustee. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it can be a problem because the attorney is no longer giving legal advice, but they, they have this highest duty of care. Uh, and, and so the question becomes, you know, when are they self-dealing? Are they self-dealing? I, I had a published case, um, big case, um, Lister Moore, conservatorship of Moore, uh, where the lawyer um, started, was appointed as trustee for his client under the instrument he drafted and just got, I surcharged him for things he shouldn't have paid for uh, from the trust but the court of appeal hammered the guy and he got disbarred. Ooh. The lawyer, uh, uh, Salzwoodell, it's a published case, right? Uh, and he's still disbarred. Uh, uh, or maybe, yeah, uh, it might still be pending in the state bar court, but the court of appeal directed it to the state bar for, for, for proceedings uh, just because of the conduct of the lawyer acting as trustee for an elderly client. Uh, at trial, I, I um, because I knew the 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 cell. He's you know he's the, the client was still is still alive. He just has cognitive issues, and and we, we were friends because he'd come to court all the time. And I'd say, do you see the gentleman over there? And it was the lawyer trustee. And he goes, yeah. And I go, do you know who he is? He says, no. <laughs> uh, because people uh, lawyers have to sort of back off. Mm -hmm. I think pro uh, professionally. In, in not uh, raising the, the um, uh, how can I say this in a, in, in, a, in a fair way? I've seen a number of cases where there's large trust estates and foundations are created and the lawyer imposes themselves as the um, trustee, as the um, trustee of this foundation, right? And I see it as an income source uh, but you have to be con really be concerned about being uh, ob to, to continue an objectivity as an estate planner uh, and, and not trying to promote business relationships for yourself. I, I think once once the settlor dies, a question will always come up as well, you know, is are, are you just utilizing this senior for business opportunity and then does it become an elder abuse question mm -hmm. and who wants to go down that rabbit hole i mean you know just do your job as a lawyer and you know put, get your somebody else in town as the trustee right all right so we've got some questions tied to some cases uh and so ryan asks if the house is not titled in the name of the trust and not referenced on the schedule of assets of the trust Will the home have to go through a full probate if there is a pour over will? So, so that this is called Hegstad, right? Mm -hmm. And and the Hegstad doctrine involves assets that are scheduled as trust assets, meaning the, the, either the trust, the body of the trust says, here's what's in trust, or more often, Schedule A says what's in the trust, and Schedule A includes the house, right? Uh, be, be, because if the house isn't titled in the trust and, and it is not designated as a trust asset, it's not in the trust, right? It's, it's a probate asset. But, but typically it's scheduled, but someone doesn't perfect the title by taking going over to the recorder's office and putting it in the trust. So, so you don't have to do a probate in the situation where, it's, where a piece of real property is identified uh, as part of the trust document. You, there, there's a way around that through a petition and I'm not going to get into Ukestad, which is a whole other course. Um, but um, those are real names, by the way. Those aren't made up names. Just for there's Hegstad, there's Ukestad, <laughs> there's Megan Cucker. Um, those are the big. Those are the big Hegstad cases. Yeah. Uh, and 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 so um, uh, so when people so to my non-lawyers, when people die, right, everything goes into bins. 
uh, think of it as bins, like bins that you would put, you know, papers in. So, so if, if there's a contract, like an insurance policy or a retirement plan or some contractual rights, those, a, a bank account where there's a POD, that's a contract, a, a paid on death beneficiary. That's a contract. And it just goes in a contract bin. It's not a trust asset. It's not a probate asset. It's a contract asset. And that's over in this bin. And if you have other assets, um, which are like, we, which I'll call survivorship assets, joint tenancy assets, where the survivor gets everything, that just, that's a whole separate bin. And then, if, and then and if there's assets that are either entitled in the trust or um, the trust document puts these assets in the trust and there's, there's a lot of uh, Cucker case relates to that, but that goes in the trust bin. Everything that's left over that's not in those other bins is it goes in the probate bin. So if, if the assets in the probate bin meet the, 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 the threshold uh, valuation to run a probate, then you have to uh, probate those under the pourable will. Patricia from Alameda again asks, at the pleading stage, which is filing the lawsuit, where a yep. caregiver or other friend has been appointed trustee it, later in the elder's life, in the last years of the elder's life, what showing would you require to immediately suspend the trustee in favor of a neutral third-party trustee? So often the misappropriation undue influence is only shown when you get into discovery, but at the outset, the family knows the elder's been defrauded. What are some, some, some paths you can take to have a, a more expedited removal? So if a caregiver is also a beneficiary, it's almost a given, right? So, so, so what I, there's a case. It used to be that trustee removal was a little more problematic because it was statutory. I mean, when I was, you know, Jim Cunningham's age, but but um, there's a case called Schwartz versus LeBeau, and, and he, whether it's a beginning class or an advanced class, I just tell my judges Schwartz versus LeBeau. You have the inherent power to remove a trustee. Why? Because because you want to, um, because it, no court that's managing a trust, which is typically in litigation, wants to deal with a difficult trustee. You just mm -hmm. there's no reason to. It's, it's like in hockey where they drop the puck and every and the two guys are slapping at it and the re, and the referee goes get out of here and puts two new guys in the circle it's I, I, I we teach it that way so uh, we we don't teach our judges to be that adherent to what's in the trust instrument necessarily if you have a problematic trustee if if if, if the trustee looks like they're squeaky clean and there's no reason to remove them that's one question but but if there's enough to to make them look a little, you know, shady, you know, if, if so you some can... some type of of um, at least allegation that there's some shadiness going on, and and does that tend to shift the burden to prove where they have to prove there's no shady activity I going on? Just go judge, you know, look look what's going on. I mean, this is you know where there's smoke, there's fire. Okay. Why don't we just get a professional in here and be done with it? I mean, you don't want to have another family member do it. You know, you, you have to go to a private professional fiduciary because the judges have a very symbiotic relationship with them. And so they going to a PPF is uh, always a good call by a litigant who wants to look like they're right going right down the middle and being neutral. And Angela asks, given that mediation is better than litigation, it, it can be a better result. What's the fastest way to get a disputed matter in front of a mediator? File a petition first, or could it work if the parties agreed to see a mediator? What do you see pre-litigation mediation, pre-filing mediation, or do you typically have a, a filing to kind of be at issue? I'd say probably 20% of, of my mediations are pre-filing okay. because A, um, uh, it's public, right? I mean, who wants their whole family finances splayed out in an accounting. I mean, that's, that's very private stuff. It's intimate stuff. Um, so, 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 uh, so, so there's a question as how, do you, uh, so Saul what was the lawyer. So that's, um, how do you spell that by the way? How do you spell it? Cause there was one question about how S A L Z W E D E L or S A L T Z W E D E L. But, but the case is called, um, uh, conservatorship of more M O O R E, but there's two conservatorship of more cases uh, with different mores, but this is Lester Moore. So if you go Lester okay. Moore, throw my last name in there and, and you'll get it. Okay. Uh, what are your thoughts on the attorney being a notary? 
thumbs up or thumbs down? Does it matter? It doesn't matter. It's Is good. it more, um, let's see. Uh, Anne asks, hi, Anne, how you doing? Uh, is the liability of a trust protector similar to a trustee while an attorney is acting as trust protector? That's a great question. I was just talking with Carl Waldman this morning about that. Um, huh. and trust protectors and trust the, the drafting attorney serving as trust protector. So, so there's a little bit of a disconnect between my colleagues and, and, and trust that have trust protectors only because this, we want our fiduciaries to be acting in a subject to all fiduciary standards, right? And, mm -hmm. and even when the trust says, uh, you know, we only will hold the trustee liable for willful misconduct and not for ordinary negligence in essence, that rankles us at some level because it's like, well, you can just mess up and, and not be responsible for it. And there's no bond typically in, in trust. Mm -hmm. So, so, so it's, it's, it's counterintuitive when we have other layered people who aren't bearing fiduciary standards. And, and I've seen it, especially in, I'll call them wrongful birth cases where there's a large personal injury award either from birth or from early childhood. And the, it's layered with a, a number of uh, trustees, including lawyer trustees. And at some levels, it, it can be seen as a, uh, a financial opportunity for lawyers as opposed to a, um, what would we call a fair and true trust? I had Metrolink, I had a Metrolink case of the largest recipient of a Metrolink award who had serious brain damage where there was a trust protector and we just 2580 it, uh, substituted judgment and then mm -hmm. just kiboshed the whole thing and, and put in a, a, a new trustee and a create a new trust. Let's talk about Geraldin. Um, you know, Birch v. George is a no contest clause. I know we're coming up. We're just passing an hour. Some people, you know, might have something else to do. I'm fine going just a few more minutes because sure. I do want to talk about mediation. But this is actually a frequent issue in our practice and in probably most of the lawyers here and pe the people watching, which is uh, somebody who becomes trustee while the parent is alive but has diminished capacity and the minefield that they're stepping into potentially. If you can talk a little bit about the judge's perspective on the duties and, and sort of best practices for, for trustees of incapacitated grantors. So, so, so Geraldin is important because Geraldin is a case out of, was it San Diego or Orange County? I think it was Orange County, where, where um, the, the set lore, William was, I mean, he was hugely successful. He was the one where he had, there were nine kids, right? But, but the last two, um, the two youngest were the joint kids of he and his wife. And he um, turned over the, the reins during his life to one of his sons, to one of the twins, uh, you know, the, the last two. And um, he blew through dad's millions like, you know, um, like, you know, I changed my socks. And, and, and so uh, when he passed, the, all the other seven kids, or at least most of them said, young brother, we're suing you for breach of trust. And the response was, well, dad hadn't died. He could still have revoked it, the trust. And, and it, was not, it was not irrevocable. So dad could do whatever he wanted. So take a, take a hike. And the Supreme Court goes, yeah, no, 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 no. Um, the beneficiaries uh, can assert dad's breach of trust claims after he dies. It was a very kind of a revolutionary thing, but it was a, it was a seven to two or five to two uh, decision by the Supreme Court. Um, and, and it was, um, it, it, it's, it expanded the, um, the, the possible liability of a child trustee um, beyond what it had been before. So uh, to, to, to the lawyers who were thinking whose clients are asking them to be trustees. You know what my recommendation is? Don't ever do it. <laughs> no good deed goes unpunished, right? Correct. And then in Ray Brace, the family code and probate code, that's a, 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 Supreme, a Supreme Court case, correct, from the summer? Right. So, uh, so, so, so very quickly, yeah. there's, there's always been a conflict between the, the um, actually it's the evidence code, which mm -hmm. says that, 
a title means what it says and to and and to to set aside uh how title is held the presumption of title you have to have clear and convincing evidence which is actually a really high standard uh despite what i teach my colleagues and so um in when you have marital partners husband and wife there's a community property presumption so in a case where it's a joint tenancy not joint tenancy community property but joint tenancy or one spouse holds title for any one of a number of reasons uh you know uh there do you look at the title or do you do you look do you use the community property presumption and, and so brace puts an end to all that discussion once and for all and says i don't care how you hold title if it's husband and wife it's community so too bad uh so that that's what brace says i mean that's a that's the gist of it there's there's it's a 60 page case and there's a lot to it but that's that's most of it Big case. I think it's something um, for for the certainly the lawyers to look at that are doing estate planning. Uh, very very important. Let's talk. Let's close here uh, for the remaining time that we have. Uh, talk about, you know, how do you hire a mediator? Um, you know, if you're in litigation and I say, well, I'd like to use, you know, Judge Reeser, and the other person's going to say, I would never use Judge Reeser because we're fighting about everything. How? What's the best way to to pick a mediator? Number one. Uh, and then because you get in a little bit of a standoff and then uh, when should you hire the mediator in the dispute resolution process at the beginning of the discovery period once discovery is up should you be doing depots just kind of give us a, a feel for your thoughts on it well i think i mean i believe because trust cases are different these aren't regular civil cases you have a, a corpus and and as money is spent down uh, because the trustee invariably has the right to use trust assets to defend the trust, not themselves, but the trust. Mm -hmm. You know, that corpus goes, nur, 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 right? And, and, and so what was once Jupiter now becomes Pluto. Uh, yes, if you do an early mediation, you're not gonna know everything, but sometimes it's better not to know everything because you know you have to know everything, it's gonna cost you litigation and conceivably hundreds of thousands of dollars both in the contestant uh, arena as well as from the trust and and from, you know, in these in these cases, there's not just two rooms, right? Quite often, I have four or five or six rooms of people who have disparate right. positions. So, so my my view is, go early, get it done. Occasionally, there's a question, you know, can we have a can we have an a, a informal account? Can you know, and we can do you can do that in the context of mediation. You don't have to file a lawsuit. To get an accounting you know can you give us the bank of america statements just so what you're telling because there's this concern about credibility within the family can we just have some you know, some comfort with uh some information and yes you can do that in the context of mediation you don't have to you know send out 300 special interrogatories um so i, I mean I, I i i think that's in some counties and it's county because I work in so many venues, right? Uh, some counties, they just litigate the case until it's ready to go to trial and then they go to mediation. And that's okay. It's just that that sometimes the attorney fees become the tail wagging the dog. You know, well, how can I settle for, for 400,000 if I've already spent 350 on attorney fees? Yeah, and that's something every county is different in California. Yep. And the, the bigger counties, have a what I call like a standing probate judge. There is a probate calendar, and but some of the smaller counties are you training those judges in probate or not? So if there's, is should, should, as practitioners, should we pick and choose venues? Because sometimes you can pick the venue that you're gonna file in, right? On some cases, should we pick one that has a, that has essentially a full-time probate judge or do you think it matters? Well, if you, if you have a problem case and you think you're gonna lose, I would pick the smaller county. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, seriously, right? So I, I so, I, I teach the judges who are assigned to a trust and probate calendar, yeah. which is only the urban and suburban counties and most and all of them, right? But but we have, and, and I, I know you guys are gonna laugh, in the smaller counties, we call them cow counties and we have cow county institutes. And I'll take road shows to the cow county institute, you know, I'll teach conservatorships and, and but these judges, you know, they go from the criminal case to the divorce case to the probate case to the, and, and, and so they're generalists, right? 
they're they're not going to understand eight ten to eight twelve issues, and 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 they're not going to have research attorneys that are going to help them. Um, uh, it's just right, right. So, so so the barefoot case, Joan Barefoot, right? Uh, I, I know the research attorney in Tuolumne County, and she goes, "That wasn't my fault," because she didn't get involved in that case. Um, it was just you know, and then the court of appeal in Sacramento sort of perpetuated the problem, which was resolved uh, last year, end of last year. But um, it's, you, you're better off before a judge who understands and appreciates the intricacies of this, as well as in a mediator, right? If somebody doesn't want me, God bless you, right? I, there's a lot of competent uh, trust and probate mediators in California, a lot in the South and, and, and lesser in the North, because I think uh, there's just an understanding in the Southern California that you always take your trust case to mediation because it almost, you know, 95% of the time it's going to get resolved. Uh, North, it's just, it's a little more, uh, it's different, right, in, from county to county. And then you're with JAMS, J-A-M-S, which is the uh, one of the big players in the dispute resolution space. Right, it's, it's worldwide. It's, it's a, you know, it's a co-op of retired judges and, nice. and just like, just like I would never want to do an insurance dispute or an employment dispute, um, some of my colleagues would never want to get involved in a trust dispute. Well, uh, we it looks like we covered questions. Um, we'll just leave it open for a couple of minutes. I just want to thank you, um, Judge Reeser, for spending time here with us today. Um, and it was, I uh, got thank you from Chris. Uh, just such a, a wonderful opportunity to be able to ask you real world questions and get your insight uh, on, on, from the guy who teaches other probate judges. I mean, how, how awesome is this? So, um, anyway, I want to thank you guys for attending. This will be recorded and go on our YouTube page, but, uh, Glenn, thank you very much again for, uh, for, uh, spending time with us today. This is fantastic. Such a pleasure. Anytime. All right. All right, guys. Thanks, Jim. See ya.